Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Book Changing Podcast. I'm your host, Tanner Jenkins, the creator of Book Changing. And today, I wanted to bring you an in-depth analysis and just my opinion on how to think like a Roman emperor by Donald Robertson. Um, I was recommended this book by Ryan Holiday. I saw it on his Instagram. He said it was one of his favorite books on Stoicism. I'm a huge fan of Stoicism. Um, and it, the book is essentially a analysis of Marcus Aurelius and, and meditations um, and Stoic philosophy as a whole. So I wanted to kind of give my thoughts and opinions on it uh, from, from a young man's perspective. I think that um, I want to title this episode Stoicism and the Art of Detachment. These are two things that have been on my mind incredibly over the past, uh, I'd say, year. A lot of a lot of crazy things uh, are going on in life right now. Um, stoicism to me is a 22 year old trying to navigate this this modern digital landscape um, that induces a, a fear and anxiety and an alarming rate. Um, it, and stoicism is all about the ability to detach and abstain from these these things, um, kind of to see it from a higher viewpoint. Um, to understand the difference between pleasure and victory is another interesting thing that I relate to Stoicism. Um, kind of the ability to abstain from immediate pleasure in order to gain a sense of victory or, or to be victorious in your goals and in your pursuits. And so I think that this book, by and large, covers that um, and, and navigates, uh, uh, maps out why that's important, why you should put victory over pleasure while you should practice abstinence through certain things and um, try to maintain a level head as you go through uh, challenges and so um, I like to say that I'm going through uh, a hectic time in life I think we all are with uh, uh, COVID-19 me personally I'm in my last semester of college um, doing it online uh, the election just happened. A lot of people are up in arms about it. A lot of my friends are voicing their opinions. Um, some some rational, some unrational, some emotional. So just to, just to give you a breakdown of where I'm at, uh, I'm 22. This is my last semester in college. I'm contemplating going to law school after I get my bachelor's in business. I'm currently working multiple part-time jobs. Uh, trying to navigate through this COVID thing, uh, living with my parents, living at home. Um, everybody's at home all the time. It's it's a a fun a fun situation for sure. And uh, trying to maintain relationships and friendships. It's it's been hectic for me. Um, so to get into the book, uh, you know, lately I've been fascinated with stoicism and this idea of transcending uh, the things around you. Um, being above it, so to speak. So going through life with this intense level of detachment while still enjoying um, living and loving through each moment to my fullest ability is something that's on my mind heavily. So to go through challenges with uh, an attitude of embracing it, an attitude of stillness, an attitude of calmness. Calmness is something that's been on my mind heavily. Um, and so I want to discuss a key, a, a couple of key takeaways from the book um, that, that helped me kind of increase this sense of calmness, this overall peace um, as challenges arise and, and new situations come. So to start, the beliefs and the foundation of Stoicism, as uh, Donald Robertson puts it, um, Stoic philosophy teaches us to accept our involuntary emotional reactions, our flashes of anxiety as indifferent Neither good nor bad. What matters isn't what we feel, but how we respond to those feelings. And so that's kind of the the general consensus of what Stoicism is. It's detaching from emotion, looking at things logically with a calm, rational mind, um, and and, uh, moving from that place of neutrality as opposed to moving from a place of uh, emotion, really. And he says, um, to continue, that they believed that we have many irrational desires and emotions like fear, anger, craving, and certain forms of pleasure that are bad for us. Stoics did not believe that unhealthy emotions should be suppressed. Rather, they should be replaced by healthy ones. 
and it's this switching perspectives from indulgence to discipline that I think is is important. A lot of people uh, look at stoicism and and think it's a negative thing. It's suppressing of emotions. It's denying that the emotions are there, and it's not that at all. It's just that you're not indulging in those emotions. You're disciplining yourself to remain logical and to make the best decision that you can. Um, And another part of the book that I really loved, this is early on in the book, he discusses kind of where Stoicism comes from. Um, And one of the founders of Stoicism is Zeno, who was... um, there's, there's a story that he includes in there. Zeno was crossing uh, the ocean um, and, and was caught in a shipwreck in which he lost everything. So he was traveling with um, pigment dye. It was a uh, purple dye. And as the story goes, it, this dye is extremely hard to get. Uh, it's, a, it's a time-intensive process. It's super valuable because they use the purple dye to dye the clothing of, of royalty kings and queens um and so it's it's essentially his whole life worth on this ship it goes down he loses everything most of his crew members he's one of the only to survive um and this led him to discover the writings of socrates so from this point he kind of he had nothing was uh, stranded um on this foreign land and ran into somebody who put him on to socrates um and and from there the ancient philosophy of cynicism which focused on cultivating virtue and strength of character through rigorous training that consisted of enduring various forms of voluntary hardship. It was an austere and self-disciplined way of life that led to fulfillment. And I think that this perspective of where Stoicism comes from is extremely important because the very roots of Stoicism are austerity and self-discipline. And through these you live a more uh, fulfilling life. It's not indulgence that leads to fulfillment, but self-discipline. And so from there, Zeno told his students, or Zeno told his students that he had come to value wisdom more than wealth or reputation. He said, my most profitable journey began on the day I was shipwrecked and lost my entire fortune. And so it is from that story that we can see Stoic philosophy teaches us to accept our involuntary emotional reactions. Um, And another thing I thought was interesting is, is he provides, the author provides a background of Marcus Aurelius, kind of his childhood, uh, the family members around him, just a, just a broad perspective of him that, that you don't get if you read meditations. Um, and so he, he, he paints the picture that uh, as an adolescent, one of Marcus's beloved tutors died. And Marcus threw a crazy tantrum that he later described as embarrassing. Having to be restrained by his servants because they were worried his behavior might seem uh, or might be seen as unbecoming of a future ruler. Because if you don't know, Marcus Aurelius was a Roman emperor um, in, in, I believe, around 100 A.D., was the time of his rule. So a quote on page 18, he says, Marcus was a naturally loving and affectionate man, deeply affected by loss. Over the course of his life, he increasingly turned to the ancient precepts of Stoicism as a way of coping when those closest to him were taken. And so more perspective on that, that statement is eight of his 13 children died in his lifetime as well as his wife. During his reign, millions of Romans throughout the empire had been killed by war or outbreaks of plague. And I find this very applicable, very interesting to our current times. You know, like we're literally going through a plague of some sort with COVID. Um, There's so much just hectic things going on. Social media is able to propagate things in such a way that it's fear mongering. And you, you only see the worst in the news. And it looks like madness when you look at these things and, uh, to to think of Marcus Aurelius, who was literally the leader of the biggest empire at the time, and all these all these things on his plate, all his children dying, his wife died in his lifetime. I mean, and then and then all of his people, his Roman people, are are dying from plague and war. For him to be able to maintain a stoic frame of mind and handle it as it goes, handle it 
the things that come his way as they come his way with a logical uh, perspective is uh, is pretty pretty impressive. And so, this brings me to the idea of of stoicism as a means of coping, which was one of my favorite ideas in the book. I think that um, even in meditations, Marcus Aurelius mentions mentions that he uses philosophy as a means of coping. He, he, much of his day is, is spent at the court, um, you know, over, over different, uh, I couldn't even imagine what different laws being passed, different complaints of the time. And he uses philosophy as something that he can find solace in, in his free time. It kind of keeps him on a straight arrow, a straight path, knowing right from wrong, so he can move out uh, or move throughout his days from that perspective. And so, um, the author mentions that Marcus had a distaste for the pretense and corruption of court life. He stated that it was only through recourse to philosophy that life at court even seemed bearable to him, and he bearable to those at court. He found the insincerity of life at court a constant frustration, and he became to rely on stoicism as a way of coping. And so that's just the idea. He he continues to um, his readings of stoicism as, as a form of keeping him sane, essentially. And I think that, that we can apply that to ourselves as well. Um, constantly referring to stoicism back to to stoic books or to videos whatever uh constantly just referring back to it to stay in this frame of mind of uh, logic over emotion and calmness and peace of mind as opposed to rage anger fear things of that nature another thing that i thought was incredible in this book is the contrast that he brings up between marcus and marcus's brother lucius um so these are two men from the same upbringing that chose different paths, that handled their, um, their high status differently. So a little background about that. Marcus and Lucius were co-emperors of Rome. Initially, Lucius was expected to take on the role of military general, but failed because he lacked the sense of duty and self-discipline required. He instead preferred to spend his time drinking and entertaining his friends. He would host lavish parties in which the finest feasts were provided as well as gladiatorial games to entertain guests. As Robertson in the book points out, you can't buy good friends though, and the extravagance attracted a retinue of greedy and dissolute individuals who encouraged the worst aspects of Lucius's character. And this gives perspective uh, for the meditations quote by Marcus Aurelius where he states, um, who, by his character, was able to stimulate me to cultivate my own nature, and yet at the same time, hearten me by his respect and affection. And that quote refers to his, his brother. Um, while the younger brother was at the chariot races, gladiatorial games, or banquets with friends, Marcus was poring over books, gaining crucial knowledge of Roman law and the bureaucracy of government. You could say Lucius chose pleasure before work, Marcus worked before pleasure. His constant pursuit of pleasure was a form of emotional avoidance, one would say. Alcohol and other diversions offered him a way to escape worry about his responsibilities as emperor. And this contrast of pleasure and victory, again, it, it comes back to that, it brings me to that. The importance of analyzing the consequences of pleasure um, and not just doing what's pleasurable in the moment, but really having the foresight to see what will bring you victory in your life, victory as far as your goals and fulfillment, what will fulfill you. Um, he mentions that Lucius <clears throat> chose pleasure before work. Um, he indulged in alcohol. Um, he, the author, he, he's kind of like a clinical psychologist, and so he said that if Lucius was, was in our day and age, he might be diagnosed with depression and anxiety, and he chose to avoid these things instead of dealing with them. Um, and Marcus chose to 
living a, a life of austerity and discipline in order to stay the straight path as opposed to avoidance and overindulgence um, to just avoid your issues. Um, and so I think overcoming obstacles through courageous and honorable deeds was the only true path to fulfillment in life. Um, the, the, these ideas that, that Robertson presents, the contrast between Marcus Aurelius and his brother uh, Lucius, it's just incredible and I'd never heard of it before. Um, I think that alone is reason to read this book. Um, and then that brings me to another point that I loved. And we're approaching the end here, so stay with me. I appreciate it. But uh, the idea of catastrophizing. Um, this is an idea, again, that, that, that really just defines stoicism. It's the idea of, of remaining calm, not to catastrophize events, not to build them up in your mind. Um, and he continues in the book to say, when people are really struggling, they focus on their inability to cope. They say things like, I can't take this anymore. This is a form of catastrophizing, focusing too much on the worst case scenario and feeling overwhelmed. Stoicism tries to paint events in a neutral light. They are neither good nor bad. It is all about your reaction to them. So we must aim to never catastrophize an event, speak of it plainly, uh, take your emotional judgment out of it. Um, and this is another idea that Marcus Aurelius returns to over and over is to speak of things in plain speech, um, not to add, you know, crazy adjectives, uh, not to feel harmed, to speak of things plainly, speak of it as it happened. It was just an event. It was neither good nor bad um, and really perceive things through that that scope. Um, another great idea, the need to escape. He, he mentions this. Marcus Aurelius has a great quote in Meditations. Um, highly recommend you check that book out if you haven't already read it. But he talks about people's need to escape um, to the countryside, to the beach, to different countries, whatever. People have this need to escape, this need to vacation from their life. Um, and essentially, it's, it's wherever you go, there you are, right? You can never escape yourself. You can never escape your issues. If you try to travel away from them, they will, they will follow you. You have to kind of have this peace of mind and this calmness um, in order to be at peace. That's the only way to do it. And so I just wanted to make quick mention of the stoic, the viewpoint that people need to escape. You know, um, Marcus tells himself that the feeling of the need to escape from life stresses this way is a sign of weakness in and of itself. This sort of dependence on being able to escape from stressful situations just creates its own problems. True inner peace comes from the nature of our thoughts rather than natural surroundings. Okay, and so that brings me to my end point, to my last point. Um, patience with yourself and patience with others. Um, and, and no one does evil willingly. This is kind of one of the end points in the book, and I think it's really powerful. And it, it, it stems from a, sto a story of a man named Cassius, betraying Marcus and trying to overrule him towards the end of Marcus's life. Um, and a quote from the book, the men serving under Marcus know him well enough to expect that he would respond with calm and dignity, even to such a shocking betrayal such as this. Upon finishing a speech to his troops, Marcus retires to his residence once again, closing his eyes and continues to meditate on how best to cope with the emerging crisis turning to philosophy for guidance and he says no man does evil knowingly which also entails that no man does it willingly marcus gave cassius the benefit of the doubt by assuming that at some level the usurper believed he was doing the right thing and was simply mistaken and so all of these quotes portray the idea of patience and empathy for yourself and for others even if they're doing wrong, the wise man will not get upset about things that lie beyond his direct control, such as the actions of others. And so, again, it's this idea to control what you can, which is your reaction to a situation. It's not to be upset. Well, how could this person do this to me? Um, to to kind of have that humility and that understanding that everyone is human, everyone makes mistakes. Um, a lot of people think they're doing the right thing, and, and you just don't perceive it that way. Um, and so it's, it's another powerful story, the story of Marcus Aurelius and how he was able to remain 100% calm as, as Cassius tried to overrule him, as, as he betrayed him. It was a good friend of his, and, 